like to call the uh, special meeting of the Freetown Lakeville <coughs> Regional School Committee to order um, September 5th, 2013 at 6.34. Do we have the roll, please? Yep. Robin O'Gara? Hey, here. David Davenport? Here. David Goodfellow? Here. Brett Kulikovich? Here. Carolyn Gomes? Here. Robert Clark? Robert Clark is uh, teaching tonight. He sends his uh, regrets. Michael McHugh? Michael McHugh is out of state. He sends his regrets also. David Brown. Okay, is anyone recording the meeting other than Lake Cam? Okay, Can you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, on the agenda tonight we have new business, and this new business is so new that the school committee doesn't even have, um, we're just seeing the information for the first time ourselves, so um, our thought was to put Community Speaks after the superintendent gets all the information out, so that way we all have the same information. Um, since this meeting was just posted um, Tuesday morning, um, tonight we're here to talk about class sizes and grades K to 5. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Nash. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, the committee should have in, in front of them the charts as of yesterday, 9-4, for our actual enrollments at the three uh, element, two elementary schools and our intermediate school. And I just would like to mention this evening that our principals are here. Uh, you certainly know Mr. LaBelle. And meeting him as the principal, new principal at AES, and you know Ms. Pinal, but you haven't had the opportunity to officially meet, and she is not working for us yet. Uh, she will be as of Monday the 15th or 16th, but Kim Safrino is here this evening, so she certainly, I'm not expecting her to be prepared. Uh, Doc, uh, Fred Morris was unable to be here this evening due to a family commitment, but um, she is here this evening also, and well. you will... You will, as I said, officially hear her introduction, and she'll be here next Wednesday at our school committee meeting. So I can begin, and uh, the committee had asked for uh, class sizes at our elementary school, so I'll begin with uh, Asa Wamset, and certainly ask, uh, at this point, I think I'd like to turn it over to the principals to go over for you the numbers, any changes that uh, they have noted even as of today, and potentially I know that Mr. LaBelle has looked at some of the errors that may have caused uh, our class sizes to uh, move in a different direction, uh, either for the good or bad. I also provided for you, so that we don't have to do the math this evening, uh, two other columns. One is the average of what the numbers look like in class sizes, and then secondly, what would happen if you added a teacher at any of those grades? What would that do? So we don't have to uh, do that math out. So we're looking primarily at um, kindergarten one, two, and three at AES, since it doesn't have an integrated preschool, as you know. So, Mr. LaBelle, if you want to go over the class sizes. Sure. Uh, our total enrollment currently, uh, as it today, is 487. Um, we currently have three uh, uh, full-day kindergarten classrooms with one uh, that uh, classroom has an afternoon and a PM, uh, excuse me, AM and PM session. Um, those two are reflected by uh, the sections four and five. Excuse me, I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, by number one and number four, those sections. Uh, the grade one, which we have, have five uh, teachers uh, in that section of 120 that is quoted there. We have uh, two classes, you'll note, that are 23, where the others reflect 24 and 25. Those classes of 23 reflect our supported classrooms, uh, those classrooms that have students with IEPs. We try to keep those slightly lower. In our second grade, which we knew was going to be large, we had added that extra teacher um, to the second grade this year. Um, those classrooms are also reflected in the supported classrooms by um, 23 in each. And the grade three, uh, which there are five classrooms totaling 122, uh, those 
supportive classrooms are reflected through the totals of 23 and 21. We had um, a total, as of today, we still have papers out on two families. Um, 40 students enrolled since July 1st. That's not counting the two that um, have papers taken out. Uh, at last year, we had one. There were uh, only seven that enrolled since July 1st of last year. So this is a remarkable difference from last year to this year. We had 14 students, though, um, enroll out of the, of the school um, since July of this year. So that brings about to like 26 total students um, that we're really actualizing within the building. Let me just make one comment. Just uh, know that the shift in grade two, that was not a new hire. That was a movement from another grade. So you didn't hire a new uh, grade two teacher. Uh, it was a shift that we had to make from, uh, I think it was kindergarten to grade two. Uh, so the class size averages are 19 in kindergarten, 24 in grade one, 25 in grade two, and 24 in grade three. That would be averages. Uh, if you were to add a teacher to any of those grades, you would reduce the class size in kindergarten by adding the sixth teacher to 16 students in grade one adding the sixth teacher to 20. In grade two, adding the seventh teacher, your class sizes would move from 25 to 21. And in grade three, adding the sixth teacher from 24 to 20. So. You had mentioned that two families could possibly um, still have their papers out. Um, if they were re to, to return their papers, how many additional kids would, would that Two children. Two children. A kindergartner and, and a second grader. A kindergartner and a second grader. Um, we had been talking for a while about, you know, anticipated, anticipated uh, declining enrollments. Um, do we have, and uh, if we had this information ahead of time, we would have asked you for this, and maybe you don't have it, and I certainly can't blame you if you don't. Do we, do we know what we anticipated as far as enrollments in kindergarten this year and what the actuals were? No. I don't know that. I, and I don't blame you for not having that, so so that's okay. Um, but certainly, this does bring to a bring to a point that any kind of anticipated uh, declining enrollment, we really shouldn't anticipate on anymore. <clears throat> it doesn't really seem that it's coming to uh, any kind of fruition. So we definitely have to keep uh, an eye on that when we do make our plans. So I know that was a uh, you know a big thing that we were saying on and on that hey, we're looking at you know a, a significant. Um, number of children less than, than previous, um, but I don't necessarily see that. Um, if, I don't, if I could just add, I had a conversation with Mrs. Gomes because we were talking about potentially where was the trend coming from, um, and it was um, not what I thought. Actually, we had uh, only about, we had about five children who have moved in for foster homes. We had um, four that cl uh, classified under school choice, um, only three coming from commercial drive, um, the rest were really from private schools back to public schools or were living with other family members that had then moved back into um, the district. And there was actually another family that was actually school choice in Bridgewater and has come back to Lakeville. So a lot of these people were actually still in, in the town. Through you, Mr. Chair, the, your school choice children, are they returning school choice children or are they new enrollees? New. New. And how many was that again, I'm sorry? Uh, be four total. Four total. Those are individuals. Uh, we took them in because they're building a home. And so uh, when I spoke with the, uh, while we could have said no, we did have some room. And because they will be in December, we may, uh, I think Ms. Bell made the wise choice in saying let's take them in now. So Absolutely. that's why. So Absolutely. Can, yeah. So they're going to enroll. Mm -hmm. Might as well take them in now, get them adjusted. You know, okay. Good, good work on that one. Okay, so any uh, questions as far as class size? Let me just say one thing about kindergarten. Typically, kindergarten is one of those moving targets in every community, uh, partly because as much as school districts advertise in the spring uh, to come in for the testing and all of that, we really don't know until they show up. 
and oftentimes uh, you get that number through census through town. Those numbers sometimes are reliable or not. Typically, it's been my experience that school districts will, in, will on a year-to-year -year basis, look at the historical data and then inflate that by 10 percent on a year-to-year, -year, knowing that that generally happens. Once in a while, you have an anomaly where you have a year where that goes way down. Uh, as you can see, the bump that we've got in one grade, in 149, that group started out as certainly being a very large kindergarten, but the rest of those grades, 120, 122, and then you can see that 96 is relatively small, a small class compared to what you have looking at grade one. So it's hard to look at those numbers and, and try to make some predictions. The, uh, one second, Dr. Sure. Uh, and maybe I missed it. Do we have a breakdown of where the new kids came in as far as grade levels? Um, no. Paul, do you know what grades you saw? I know that we talked about it. Yes, I do have that. <laughs> um, there were four, the 14 in kindergarten, uh, six in grade one, 11 in grade two, nine in grade three. Thank you very much. One had how many, Paul? I'm sorry? How, how many in grade one? Oh, six. Okay. Right, I got that. Just a, a quick question on how we're going to run tonight. Are, are we going to primarily comment school by school, or are we going to generally talk about all of this together at the end, or, or are we going to do both? Because I'll pretty much hold my comments until we hear from all the principals. I was kind of, my thought was that we would kind of just get the information out school by school. The committee can ask questions after the presentation, and then we'll look for a recommendation from the superintendent, and we'll um, then <coughs> discuss it. Okay, Dr. Nash. Thank you. Uh, Freetown Elementary School, and Kim, I know, is uh, looking at this probably information for the first time. First time. So I, I certainly uh, will work with her. But I just would point out that uh, there is a, obviously a difference in total enrollment uh, of 64 less students. So when we look at the two elementary schools and we try to obviously ensure that we have equity in programs. Sometimes that isn't always the case with 487 students reaching you know, close to 500 at AES and 423 uh, in FES. So I'll just point that out. So the total enrollment as of today, like Dr. Nash said, is 423. 72 of them are preschoolers, 79 kindergartners, 78 first graders, 90 second graders, and 104 third graders. There are seven sections of pre-K, four sections of kindergarten, two full day and two half day. There are four se sections of first and second grade and five sessions of third grade. The average class size is 12 in pre-K, 20 in kindergarten, 20 in first grade, 23 in second, and 21 in third. Anybody have any questions for Freetown <coughs> Elementary School? Okay. And the other thing I would point out, if, just to, for the audience and also to remind us that the, our integrated preschool program for the district is housed at FES. So when you withdraw those 72 students, the number becomes even less and you're looking at 351 students in kindergarten through grade one compared to 487. You're never going to have the equity in numbers um, that you would want to have because you've got that disparity simply in the number of students who are enrolled in each building. Okay. okay. So I again, if we were to look at the uh, adding a teacher in any of the programs and particularly looking at kindergarten, that would bring our class size from t currently 20 to 16. It would bring our class size in, in grade 1 to 16 from 20, in grade 2 from 23 to 18, and in grade 3 from 21 to 17. If you were to compare that to AES, you can see that uh, with the exception of one grade <coughs> kindergarten, the numbers would be under 20 in FES if we were to make a reduction in any of those other grades as compared to the numbers in AES, which would be 20. 21 and 20 respectively. Thank you. Okay, moving on.
moving on to uh, um, Judge R. Austin Intermediates. Sure. Grades four and five. So we have um, a total enrollment of 470 students. We currently have eight sections of grade four. Last year we had 10 sections of grade four. We had um, gone down to eight because of the class sizes were an average of 25. We've had about 15 move-ins to grade four and 10 in grade five. We have 10 sections to grade five, average class size of 25. Just so you know too how the intermediate school works, it's not like elementary um, at Freetown and Assawanset where it is self-contained. So we do do a team teaching model. Um, so which is why we got rid of two teachers in grade four going down to eight so that we can still maintain the team teaching model that we currently have. So if we did add a teacher, um, again, just so you have all the information, it would either then be three three-man teams or we could add keep the four two-man teams, add the one teacher, but you are now looking at inconsistency in what they teach and the amount of minutes per subject. Because right now how the team model works is it's a 100-minute math block and a 100-minute ELA block. Um, if you add, make three-man teams, it doesn't <coughs> work that way. Um, it would be very inconsistent per team. Um, and the schedules, the entire scheduling system would need to be revised. Um, unless, like I said, we added, if we added the teacher, it would be one self-contained classroom. So we'd have one classroom in the building that would be run like the elementary schools, um, which then we could maintain the 100-minute blocks um, and at least keep the scheduling and time, time frames consistent. Um, the elevated, the 29 and 28 that you see in grade four, that actually are two classes of 27. The reason it says 29 and 28, those are the students that are in the language development program but we needed to assign them home, home rooms because they go to specialists like gym, art, and music. Um, that's why they're placed there. So it is actually 27 across the board in grade four. Um, and grade five, the same thing, that class that says 27 is a class of 25. Two students come out and go to the language development program for the entire day except for specialists. So for academics, that too is an average of 25 students in the class. Okay. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Do we have do we have any um, history here as to how many movings we had last year or the year before that? No. Okay. Um, I, it just I don't have that information. Seems like goodness gracious. Uh, you know, twenty five in two grades, and then four. We had nine alone on Tuesday. Nine students enroll on Tuesday the day before school. Nice. We were up to nine. So that gave us lots of good advance notice. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, it, enrollments typically. I'll keep. Will, I'll keep my questions. You know, you'll, you'll even see enrollments continue next week. So I mean, th obviously this week it will be a very busy week for enrollments and changes, uh, and you'll even see it next week, and then it will die down. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we don't have that information. That's fine. Thank you. Anyone else from the committee? Okay, Dr. Nash. So at this point uh, in time, I think the question really is, uh, is I understand this committee would like to have some discussion as to um, what, if anything, would be uh, a recommendation for where our, our numbers are large. And I did some research to see whether or not the, this school committee had any guidelines for class sizes which uh, I could not find any, so I'm assuming that it, it doesn't exist. There isn't probably a lot to be said about why class sizes should be 25, 26, other than typically uh, in, in budget-constrained um, districts, as most of us are. Uh, we look at those class sizes. When you look at a lot of the research, uh, if you really want to uh, do what is instructionally <coughs> at the best, you're looking at class sizes that typically run uh, 20 or a little less. Uh, and when you make a shift of one or two, the research suggests that it really doesn't have a significant impact. You really need to get it below a certain barometer, and that barometer that, that most people will tend to, to hover around in the early grades is, is in the very, you know, high teens, low 20s. Again, give or take a student. But, when you start looking at making substantial um, changes to instruction that can happen in classrooms, you really want that ideally. So 
when you look at any of this, I, th there's certainly with a few exceptions, you could look at any of these and say, we should reduce it. Um, so the question is really um, where, if any. K, you know, when you look at kindergarten, there's a, there's a rationale for kindergarten, uh, why you should reduce it at kindergarten, particularly uh, with students who need a lot of support. We, we talk about the, the need to make sure that students learn to read between K and three. But yet when you look at grade four uh, and what we do with students, there's a need there. And, and I don't wanna sound like I'm walking around all of this, but the reality is you could make an argument for reducing uh, at almost any grade with a few exceptions. Uh, and it really is a philosophy uh, of a school district of the, um, to keep class sizes um, at a certain uh, level. So it's hard for me to tell you where specifically uh, at this point in time. Uh, I'd be more curious to hear what's been the past history and what this committee has really uh, done with class sizes. Uh, I've tried to do some research to look at uh, what was done in discussions around uh, the budget for this year in looking at the different proposals and also in looking at regionalization and what benefits that might have. And some information showed class sizes at 28, 27 at the elementary level and some suggested that the numbers would be very uh, would be lowered. But from my perspective, the other concern that I have is wherever the committee uh, would like to go with this, the question and direction that I need is where would you like me to look for the funding for this? Because we certainly, uh, the business manager, the director of finance can talk about where we are right now and this is very early in the year, as I said to you, and we have just looked at the payroll so he can give you an indication of where we might feel because obviously we need to fund these positions and we need to be able to sustain them uh, for the year and we need to be able to look to see whether or not um, that's something, that model, the smaller class size is something that we want to continue and that would be something that obviously you would address when you're building your FY15 budget. But it's, it's very hard for me to say to you to give you a recommendation. I, I really would look for more being the new person and not really having but this week being in classrooms and visiting people to be able to really truly understand philosophically where this district feels that sizes should be smaller. So I know that that's not really an answer probably you want, but uh, it's, it's the honest answer that I can give you at this point. But the business manager or the director of finance, I should say, is, is prepared to give you a little bit of a brief synopsis of we, we see ourselves right now in this early stage of the budget <coughs> and what some of the um, hot areas are that we're watching, that we have a uh, potential uh, for some concern and others that we feel maybe a little bit more comfortable or others that we just simply have no information right now until a little bit later on, uh, maybe in the later fall. Uh, essentially, uh, I started by looking at the certified staff and the parents. And because we do have the people on board now, with a couple of exceptions, and you know, I, I was able to plug in probable members for those. And it, it looked like at that point, you know, we were about 180,000 to be good. Then I started to look at some of the other accounts. <coughs> um, one of the ones I'm concerned about is the substitute teacher account. We have the same amount budgeted as we had last year, and we were 120,000 short. Actually, it's both the substitute teacher and para's account together. So I need to do some work on prior years and see if last year was an anomaly or what the situation is. But, you know, we were almost universally short across the board. So that, that's a, a number of concern. Um, another number that is actually real is the, uh, the special ed contracted services. It looks like based upon services that we've committed to, there were 120,000 shot. Part of that has to do with um, a lesser amount in one of the federal 
special ed grants where we were 65,000 short. So this, you know, of the 120,000, 65 to 70,000 is money we're picking up or we have to cover from there. So unlike the 120,000 in the substitutes, which is, you know, just a concern that is probably fairly real, the uh, contracted services is real. Um, I also looked at the special ed tuition account. We have about a million three budgeted. We have about a million eight in commitments. We can cover the difference by using the circuit breaker money, which is intended for special ed, that we carried forward last year and money in closing the books that we put into circuit breaker and the circuit breaker money we will bring in in the coming year. So we can apply about 500,000 of a total pot of potentially 600,000 and cover that. Now the issue there is sustainability. That if the special ed tuition account stays fairly constant. Now, obviously, some students will leave and some students will come in, but, and there may be great variances in, in their costs. But if it stays fairly constant, we're going in with a special ed base to next year's budget that's clearly underfunded. But that problem can be solved in the immediacy. Uh, we're looking at some facilities issues that we didn't expect. Uh, we had an issue with condensation and a roof leak that cost us some money at Grace. We have an issue where the uh, PA system, which drives the bells and the announcement at the high school was hit by lightning. Uh, we don't quite know how much the damage is, but uh, we're working on that now. Certainly not something we anticipated. Um, we've had to add some special ed positions at the middle schools, at the middle school. We've also had to add some powers, uh, some of them having to do with uh, students who need one-on-one -on -one service. So we've had to add those positions. Um, we looked very closely at the um, health uh, insurance accounts because they're big accounts for both the um, <coughs> retirees and the staff. The retirees account is right on target. It's about where it ought to be. Initially, it looks like there's some money in the account for the, for the non-retired staff. However, the way health insurance works, if you come in and start in September, new, um, it doesn't get picked up right away. You land up making a double payment and we land up making a double payment in October. So the numbers we have aren't totally accurate yet. Uh, there might be a potential for picking up some money there, but it's, it's really too early to tell. It's interesting that um, we have different health care plans and we've had a number of people choose greater than any of the last eight or nine years, the more expensive plan, which is the more expensive plan for them and also the more expensive plan for the district. So we've had some shift going in that direction. Um, so sort of in summary, uh, there's a fair amount more work to be done, but you can see, um, you know, we have some real negatives and some potential areas that need to be looked at. Questions for the business manager? <coughs> okay. So, uh, the question is, where do we where do we go from here? Uh, and I would ask uh, a couple of things to think about, like anything else. And the principal certainly uh, can talk uh, to this. What if decisions are made? Uh, and direction is given to us to look somewhere in the budget, which is what we would look from the committee. One of the things that you need to consider is uh, the implementation timeline and how would that impact students and, and trying to uh, keep in mind that uh, 
if there is no one on the recall list, if the committee chooses to put a position back, let's say, in a grade, uh, and there's no one on the recall list, then we need to post that position. We need to advertise. Principals need to interview and certainly need to make their recommendation um, to the superintendent, and I need to meet with that individual. So that's going to take a little bit of time. So by the time, from a very practical point of view, that, that all of this could happen, if it could happen, that would be by the time we were able to look to say, where would the money come from? The committee is comfortable with that. If there's areas where we could identify that and, and go through this process, you could be looking at somewhere, at the best case, beginning of October, uh, maybe mid-October. And then you want to look at the impact of then at any of the levels of sending out um, and making changes for students at that time of the year. So that's one thing I think that, that's important to remember from a student perspective. What does this do? What's the impact? And what will that do? So when you make that decision, I would ask that you also think about that, which I'm sure you do. Discussion? You know, I'd, I'd, I'd throw the one back at you. I mean, I'm not a professional educator. I'd mm -hmm. ask for your opinion on, you know, how does that affect uh, mm -hmm. a student to be withdrawn from a uh, classroom setting, mm -hmm. certainly, you know, in, in an early um, mm -hmm. grade that, you know, has developed mm -hmm. some comfort level and routine, mm -hmm. and then to force them to go through it all over again, mm -hmm. you know, a month later, mm -hmm. month and a half later. I can speak in general, and I think certainly the principals who are there day to day can give you the specifics. I think my sense would be that it is probably a little bit easier for, and this is a generalization for students at an older level than it is at a younger level. But having said that, there are some students that wherever you do that, they have already begun to develop relationships uh, with the teacher and also with students. So it really, uh, although I'm making a general statement saying that upper grades probably would have less impact. It really does depend on the, on the individual student, as you know. You're all parents, so you know that probably better than I. I don't know if the principals want to echo in on that. I mean, I agree that it would, it would be easier for, for fourth and fifth grade as far as change. Again, the only thing with, with my unique situation is if we add a teacher, and even if I, I put that teacher with a two-man team, to recreate the schedule, because if we did that, these 25 kids, say it was a class of 20, 24, would still have the other two teachers. So those relationships that they formed, they could continue. But the schedule would now to be would need to be changed. So now you're affecting 75 kids, because you're affecting all three classes, not just one. Or the other situation is you have them be self-contained, and now those that one class of students doesn't have access to what the remaining eight classes of students have. And that one teacher also would, would kind of be on an island on their own. They would not be able to be a part of the common clinic time. Because right now we have math and ELA separate, where one teacher teaches math, one teaches ELA, so they can focus on that. Their common clinic time, their PD, everything they do is around that one subject. This one teacher would be a very unique situation. So that, that's just another thing to think about in five grades. Um, correct me if I'm wrong through my experience with the school committee. Again, not a professional educator, so I had to defer to you for your expertise on this. Um, that it, it seems to me that the drive has always been to try and get the lower the lowest class sizes at the lowest grades. Mm -hmm. So if I were, if we were looking at, at a situation where we were you know, trying to make some sort of impact and we could only make a limited impact, would it be the opinion of the administration that it, that impact would be best at the lowest grade possible? Yes and, and no. Okay. I know. Uh, well, yes and no. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, because I think the demands today. Uh, let me let me step back from that. I think the demands today have changed dramatically, and uh, what we do and how we teach kids, students in grades one, two, and three with respect to balanced literacy and then other elements of response intervention uh, probably would echo that. However, having said that, when you look at all the standards in the Common Core and everything else that's happening, uh, any grade, you know, K-5 could benefit and even, quite frankly, K-8 could benefit from smaller class size. But the answer to your question, short answer is yes. Um, school districts tend to look at that. Um, 
partly because of, of what's required, the, the whole concept of learning to read becoming so critical, and the fact that if we are going to intervene with students, we do it earlier than later. So it's, it's you know, do we do it now when they're younger and we can have the advantage of smaller class sizes and, and thus not have students needing additional services when they are moving on to either an intermediate or a middle school? So yes, the answer is yes. Oh, go ahead. No, I just had a, a kind of to tie on, if you don't mind. Um, so to make it even more difficult for you, the risk-benefit analysis, if we were to try and make an impact at the lowest grade by adding a session, we would in fact be, from what we just discussed, uh, perhaps doing the most, um, I don't want to say harm, but uh, causing the most disruption to a child in a younger grade by moving them out of a session. So in your, again, expert opinions, um, what would you consider the best scenario if I said, yeah, you can have you know, a, a small increase in sessions at the lower grades, but what's better for them, to stay in the larger class size where they develop their relationships or to be removed mid-session into a lower class? Where do you think that that, and I know that's a tough mm -hmm. one. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Yeah. In many ways, the train has left the yeah. station. Okay. Yeah, and um, I suspected that that would be part of the answer. Which starts tomorrow. Um, and there, there are arguments, if, if there's the possibility of adding a session to one of these, there are arguments to each of these grade levels. You know, philosophically, if, if, if this was a, something that just fell down from the sky, I would put it in first grade because foundationally, I believe the lower class sizes there um, are, anytime you can decrease it, just creates a great learning environment for those, those students. Grade two, even though we have six, um, social emotional needs are high in that grade level, so wouldn't it be great to have one there as well? Um, grade three, ooh, it's an MCAS, yeah, wouldn't we look lower the class sizes there to, to benefit those kids? So, I'm not really sure. It, it's a difficult decision to make right now. Those teachers a, a, in my building, as I said, the, the train has left the station, um, and they're, they're charting a course right now, regardless of the number of kids in their, in their classroom, um, they're planning based on what they've got right now. And to disrupt that, I, I do have concerns about disrupting that now that we've, we've gone underway. I mean, schedules can be redone. You know, logistics of people in the building can be retooled. Um, but we're talking about the child itself, and you know, that's a, a pretty, disruptive thing to happen. Thank you. Also so we have to be taken very seriously. If we don't do it. I hear you. Carola? Um, although I'm, I'm a big advocate of small class sizes, um, I, I hear what you're all saying about the disruption to the children. Um, and, and I guess where I'm going would be more on the, on the para idea of adding Carries to the, some of the classrooms or, or to the grades. Um, I know um, currently we have we have a couple of positions <coughs> that have not been filled. If that would be um, an option or what you would think of instead of instead of hiring those um, the interventionists or the technology specialists, if we were to um, mitigate some of the circumstances. Um, and, and add some paras to, um, to the, mm -hmm. I know it's not an ideal situation, um, but I mean, if, if we were lacking the funding in order to make a difference in some of these grades, I just wanted to get your thoughts. Well, I didn't develop your FY14 budget, so I really don't know the philosophy that um, put these positions in place. So for me to second guess all the discussion and, and the thought that went through with this committee and with the former administrators in, in determining why interventionist positions would be um, something that are needed in the curriculum integrated, uh, integration positions. It's hard for me to make a comment. I wasn't here, I didn't develop it, and I, and I don't know uh, the impact in that discussion. So for me to say, you can wipe these out, I think it would be presumptuous of me, quite frankly, uh, not knowing. Uh, I can comment on, in general, on adding, you know, paras to classrooms, obviously. I know what that does. Uh, it puts another set of hands in the classroom. It's not a teacher, but it certainly helps 
um, to aid a, a teacher, but uh, in teaching that class and in supporting that teacher, I should say, in that teacher's role. Uh, but the school district moved away from that. There was a philosophy that, quite frankly, was developed in, as part of your budget, and w of which I wasn't part of. And so for me to say, this is the way you want to move back, again, is, is I, I'm uncomfortable to say that because you know more than me about the decisions you made in these positions. Uh, if you ask me which would I not fill, you know, again, um, you had a value to these when you voted them as part of your budget and, and, and those who are here. And, and that's why it's, it's hard for me to say I wouldn't fill these uh, as opposed to those positions. There's an argument for all of them, obviously. I know what the positions are. I know what they uh, are expected to do. Uh, again, you know, we know why they're not filled at this point in time. So you do, you're absolutely right that there's money that's sitting in this budget that has uh, not been uh, assigned to these positions and that certainly is a direction that this committee can give to the superintendent um, to do but I'm just uncomfortable not knowing you know the philosophy and the rationale for why these positions but I certainly think that there, there was a lot of discussion that must have happened to make that move away from paraprofessionals I want to just note that the paraprofessionals that we put back in were paraprofessionals that had not been accounted for in students' IEPs, that there had been miscalculations. These were not general ed paraprofessionals. These were as a result of individual students whose IEPs had indicated uh, and they were not accounted for and or for a program, a substantially separate program, where we had too many students for the teacher and the individual, the other para who was in that program. So um, as of today, I had to add another paraprofessional to our middle school program because of the ratio of students and their needs and what was happening in that program to make it effective so that in the end we will keep students in district and not be sending them out. So those are, we have many unanticipated costs um, that the building principals will tell you about as we've um, gone through and opened the school year that were not in your budget and we're finding some of them. Uh, the reference that the director of finance made to contracted services. We're still hunting down where those contracted services would be. We were able to find some of it, but typically in a SPED budget, you find a line item called contracted services. These are for contracted services that our students already are <coughs> entitled to. And that was $250,000 worth of services, of which we found about 140 at this point. We're hopeful that we're going to find the rest somewhere. But this is what we're digging through right now. And that's why I guess I get a little bit of a angst, uh, know, not knowing you know, where that's going to come from, other than obviously these positions that are not right now um, funded in the sense that we haven't hired anybody. And none of those positions, as, as you know, have, um, we have hired for at this point. Before, um, I just have a quick question for Paul before I forget. How many student teachers do you have and in what grades? Student teachers? Yes. Um, I believe I have five. Okay. What grades? I have um, two in, I believe in, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'm a little embarrassed, I don't have that really Okay. Fast, but I have um, grade three. Yep. Um, grade two. Okay. And I, actually, I think they're actually all between grade two and grade three. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Davenport, then we'll look over. <clears throat> um, a little earlier, Dr. Nash mentioned that uh, we don't really have as a, um, as a committee um, direction on class sizes, and, and she's right. We've, we've brought her up. In fact, one of the folks in our former committee member talked about this a few times. Um, this is probably something that we should try to work on and settle this year because it's part of why we're here. Oh. One thing that we do have is we do have the budget presentations that we held to pretty steadfastly through the entire winter and spring. They never really changed, you know, substantively. And um, the tier two budget was built as not a total pie in the sky. It was built to try to be reasonable but somewhat ambitious to, to move the school forward. And almost immediately the thought was that we would never get there. 
it was going to require an override, an override wouldn't pass, and so forth. Well, what we ended up getting, I'm sorry for the history lesson here, is um, we, we got an override in Lakeville that fell, it, it, we ended up falling, and, and Freetown followed suit without creating <coughs> any problems. So we fell between Tier 1 and Tier 2. But if I look at the Tier 2 average class sizes that we talked about again and again in those budget presentations, I've got at S Wompset, uh, kindergarten 20, this is averages, first grade 23, second grade 24, third grade 24. Um, we're not that far off. You know, I'm not, I'd like to have the class sizes as just as low as every teacher would ever want them, you know. Um, but then when we look at Grace, we're at, we're at 27 in actual enrollment and we were, we were projecting 24. Now, even so, we didn't get tier two. We fell several hundred thousand dollars short of tier two. Um, and the override was great. Uh, if we didn't get the override, we were looking at class sizes in some cases that, that were being projected out to 40. And I think we're forgetting that very quickly. So what am I building to? I mean, per personally, the, the one that jumps out the most to me is Grace. You know, but our, our, great, our principal for Grace is telling us that there's even problems they're trying to add. Yes, it would be great to add, but here are the problems that go with it. Um, I mean, I, I was one of the folks that asked for this meeting because I was hearing numbers that were a bit higher than what we're actually being presented with tonight. They compare somewhat, with, at least with the Tier 2 projections that were being made and that we were trying to deliver to the community. Um, I think this is great that we're having this discussion tonight. I find myself not really, you know, with a, with a, a clear mind of, of where to go, although I, I have to admit that the grade four number is, is the one that's challenging me the most. Um, but, I, but these numbers are more or less what we promised to the community. There is somewhat of a disparity between Assawampset and Freetown. Um, that was projected also. Now, and some of the numbers I was hearing was kind of indicating more of a disparity. It's a little bit less in these numbers than what I was kind of hearing last week. And I was getting some community comments about some bad blood. Well, we passed the override, and here's what we get for it. You know, we get the short end of the stick. We were already projecting it. We should have settled those things in the spring. Um, I mean, I would like this, the, all the elementary sections to be absolutely smooth and even across the board. Um, we need to revisit topics like whether or not uh, kids can be assigned to schools geographically, which when we did the education models uh, subcommittee a few years ago, um, we polled parents and we asked that question, you know, what would your feelings be about that? And we thought that that would be shot down by universally by almost all parents. But I, if you, Maria, it was something like... It was, okay. it was something like 80% of parents didn't didn't feel that there was a... Uh, I don't know the figures, but I disagree. I remember a Freetown select in one of those meetings saying no Freetown child would ever go to Lakeville. So well, that might have been a Freetown selectman, but I'm, I'm talking about the poll that we did I for the parents. I don't recall that number okay. at all. Yeah. Do you recall that number? But, um, at any rate, it, no. was a, it was a strong majority. All I'm saying is it's something that could be looked into if we're trying to even out a disparity in our communities. Yeah, we are one district we now. We've got to get our mind about that. We really have to get our mind around the fact that it's not it is the Freetown Lakeville School District. We are one. Every exactly. person on this board represents both communities. We really have to get our minds around the fact that we are fully regionalized. So I mean, I, I'd like to see any of these lowered. I'd like to see people happy. I'd, I'd, if somebody is saying, I mean, John McCarthy back in that time period was saying that we ultimately should be trying to hit very high teens, 20-ish. In his presentations, I've looked <coughs> at them. Um, you know, we've we've. We've got to make some commitments. We've got to get it in our vision and in our goals, and we've got to and we've got to work towards it. Or we have to sit down and we have to re rewrite our vision and our goals, because we seem to keep changing them all the time. Um, that's my point. Four, fourth grade is the one that jumps out to me. Right this second. Thank, Thank you, Dave. Brett. Uh, yeah. Basically, to you know, obviously we don't have the funding thing figured out. It's going to take some work. Obviously, uh, I can't give advice on developmentally where the kids need to be if it's first graders moving or fourth graders moving, but to kind of amplify what Dave's saying here, um, we voted a budget. We voted it based on presentations we were given in January and then later right before the override. And what I'm looking at here is that, yes, you know, over in grades, grade four, tier one funding, 
Tier 1 funding said 24 kids in a classroom, not Tier 2. Tier 1 also said 24, and we're at 27. We've got to fix that. You know, when I look over and I do see that we told the community, the parents, that there would be 23 kids in a classroom, and I'm seeing 24 on average in grade 1 in AES, that's not okay. We've got to fix that. Same thing with grade 2. It's supposed to be 24. That's Tier 1 funding, not even Tier 2. 24 students, it's 25. It's on us. We've got to do something about this. This is what we told the parents we were going to produce. We didn't, so now we've got to figure it out. Some of these other ones don't look great, but it's also, you know, it's where we are. But some of these are exactly where tier, tier 1 put us, and we are beyond Tier 1, so we've got to do something about this. At least three of these have to get uh, additional teachers, and I know I don't know where the money would come from. You know, I, I think, you know, that would be great. Uh, just to comment on, on your comments, I mean, there's no way you're going to add three teachers and then get your classroom sizes down to, what, 12? No, it's going from 27 down to 22. Well, you got to move this. kids inside the grade. You can't take second graders and put them in third graders. But, you know, I mean, you no, can't add one. No, grade four right through 27. Grade yeah. four actually um, Wait. for grades. I'm going to finish my thought. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> but in any case, um, you know, I think that, you know, this just goes to show how dynamic a school budget is. Yeah. I mean, there is no way that we ever could have possibly sat here back in last January and said, yeah, nine kids are going to show up at the intermediate school door the day before we open it. Um, you know, I would love to find out. I don't know if we're going to be able to do anything about this. I really don't. I think that's the reality of that. And we heard that the ship has sailed and things like that. And the harm that we can do by moving kids around and the, 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 we have to you know, get some information on risk benefit analysis of where it's best done and who's hurt least and all this other fun stuff. I think that you know, we have to figure out how we can do this better. Um, I don't know if we can react to this now. I think we've got to think about how we, how we can do this better. And I'd love the information on how many people enrolled last year. Is there some way we could have anticipated this? Is there some way that we can get our hands around not that the fact that Freetown Elementary in Asawansa schools aren't so geographically remote that one student who physically lives in one town can't go to the, the community school in the other. Um, you know, it, it's it. We can do our very best planning, Brett. It's when the the dynamic of the situation brings it beyond our control. You know, uh, we, we, we do our very best, mm -hmm. I think. And I don't think that anyone on this on the school committee at the time we developed the last project, uh, project or when we went before the override were insincere in what our expectations were. were, were. Um, so then it calls into question, yeah, we have to try and deliver the best program we possibly can. Are we obligated to, to is this committee exactly obligated to deliver exactly what it said when the circumstances were beyond its control? I think we, we have to try our very best, but we have to live within our means. Um, so I appreciate what you're saying, and I understand, and with all respect to Mr. Goodfell. Um, and also, up to also maybe even parrot a little bit of what uh, Mr. Davenport was saying earlier, that yeah, 23 and 24 are very close. You know, if I look at AES grade one, 23 was, you know, what we were targeting, and it's at 24. And I know that we've got to kind of move within our means here and get these things to work and do the best that we can with what we've got. But when I do look at grades, it gives me pause that we sat in front of many rooms full of people and said 24 was tier one, and they're at 27 right now. And that, that happened on more than one occasion, you know, two different presentations at least, where we said that number was 24 and it is 27. And I think that it is on us as a committee to do something about this, because we can't, it's not just a simple 23, 24. We're also talking about a very large class size. 27 on average. Some of the, this one classroom here is 29. This other section is 28. And we could fix that to 22, which is much more civil, and get within the range of what even Tier 1 funding was proposing. That's all I'm trying to do. Or to that point, I will <coughs> add that Tier 1 funding, like Tier 2 funding, and like the Tier 1 and a half funding where we ended up was based upon enrollment projection and enrollment oh, yeah. numbers that turned out to be totally wrong. So what do you do with the nine families that showed up at Grace on Tuesday? Do you tell them, gee, sorry, come back next year? You know, we'll put the kids in the budget. 25 kids in two grades. That's huge. Yeah. And I that's mean, above our, pro our projections. We must have projected that there'd be some additions. Help me out with that. I mean, I know we don't know the numbers, how we do it every year, but we I must have projected there'd be I, some additions. I don't additions. know how they did it in this district. Typically, um, other than kindergarten, which is the real unknown, 
you look at your historical data for move-ins and you use that and then sometimes you're wrong because you projected um, based on history um, that this would happen. So you look at that, you, look, you can look at some NESDEC data, you can talk with your town officials, this is what, you know, we used to talk with town officials and find out about some new building projects or it would be a heads up um, to me as, as, as the superintendent. But uh, you had, as I think Bethany pointed out, 25 move-ins, move which to me is quite a, that's a class, if you will, more than a class. Uh, and I don't know whether that's atypical. And what I don't know is whether the numbers that you were looking at were actually real numbers just moving up the grade, just moving grade three to grade four without a 10% inflation or a 5%. I, I don't know. I wasn't here. And I think Bethany's the only one so who could speak to this. And just move it up. Again. Yeah. And yeah. with an inflation of, say, a grace and more than yeah. about seven students, yeah. um, this is, again, atypical, just like Asawan said, as far as move-ins and enrollment. Again, nine alone on, on Tuesday is, is not the norm. Hasn't been the norm mm -hmm. since I've been here in my four years. Um, Remember, the, there's always the good news in this. Your Chapter 70 funding is based on October 1st enrollment. So if those numbers are up, that's, that's always good, at least. Um, so there is a positive to that. There are people who certainly have, for whatever reasons, um, have chosen either to come back or are moving into Lakeville and Freetown. Um, we certainly have, have seen that. So I think there are, you know, those are positive things. Uh, you want that in your school district. It's just that you're struggling now with numbers that are, you know, coming in and relatively late. There isn't any kind of early enrollment. There's not. We don't close our doors. We're public schools. If you come in next week, we take you. We don't say sorry. There's no room. And guess what? We'll put you in another grade. We take you. Uh, that's why we're public educators, and that's why we do this. But so it's very hard to project that. And and I think different school districts use different approaches. Some will just automatically bump it up, and then what <coughs> happens when they don't come there? You've got to make that readjustment in your budget. It's a staff person. You're dealing with that, and, and so it is difficult to project. Other than and even in kindergarten, it's probably the same. I I'm looking at. Um, Brett, I'm looking at a, a tier one presentation from February 6th that indicated that in grade, in grade four it was 24, in grade five it was 31. This was a February 6th one that I have, and then for if, grace? yes, for grace. 24 and 31. Yeah. Yes, and then if, if it was tier two, it would be 24 and 24. That's yep. what I found. Is that, is that the most recent one? Yes. Oh, okay. I just, want, I just didn't know if that was... Okay, so, so you're in between. I know it's not perfect. And I think Bethany and I, Bethany and I had this conversation, and, and I would definitely say to you, I would not change the model. There's a strong benefit to the two, two member teams for all kinds of reasons that we could go into. So if you're going to do anything there, I would not. I can tell you this, is, this unequivocally, I would recommend you stay with a two member team. Um, that if you're going to add one, you better add two. I think there's a real equity issue to have one teacher teaching all subjects. We, we have designed a model that is very effective. It's not a model that is just used in, in this particular school district. It's used in many school districts, no matter what it's called, intermediate school or upper elementary or whatever. And it's an effective model, particularly with the Common Core and, and what's happening for teachers. So. All right. I'm going to make a quick comment and then I'm going to take a question from Mr. Goodfellow. Um, during last year's budget presentation, I was a proponent of taking a serious look at going to a four school model. And with this enrollment, I'm glad we didn't. I'm really glad we didn't because that blows it right out of the water. We wouldn't be talking about, you know, do we add a teacher or two? We'd be talking about where do we add space to the building to house these kids because there's no way we could house all these kids at um, Austin Intermediate. So, Mr. Goodfellow. I just wanted to hear the rest of Bethany's comment. I apologize, my, my thoughts. No, no, that's okay. I just, I just wanted. Down at the number. This is inaccurate. It actually wouldn't be if we added an additional teacher to grade four. It would still be average class size of 24, 25 kids, not 22. <coughs> okay. Just so we, see, we have that information. All right, thank you. It would still be 24, 25 kids. I didn't mean to stop you. No, yeah, my apologies. <laughs> thank okay. you for that. Okay. So back to the committee, Carolyn. And then. I, I had a while he was pre presenting, you had you had let us know that um, um, a sped um, <coughs> position at the middle school had been hired, and and you also had to hire back Paris. How, how many Paris had to be hired back? Well, uh, we. 
I'm going middle school. Probably three that I can recall at this point, and those are all uh, program-driven or individual students' IEPs. And, but again, um, the, I can't I'm say yeah unequivocally. I'm, I'm um, we had to add. Um, yeah, I know that there were two or three program, and then program and or individual students and, and it, it may not stop there so you just need to know I, I think we've recalled now th we've recalled three as a last count that I, re I can remember Amy with um, so far we've recalled three 1.0 Paris we've recalled 1.5 1.6 okay there you go <laughs> so that's so it's two part-timers and three full-timers right been so that's so that's 4.1 total <coughs> FTEs. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So those were not, um, those were cut out of the budget, yeah. um, but they were driven by uh, the programs and or the fact that as uh, the Director of Student Services reviewed IEPs, um, the students were assigned um, one-on-ones and we did not have them in place. Okay. Thank you. No, no, really, no. Thank you. I am. Yes. Thank you very much, though. Um, going back to a, a comment Carolyn brought up a little while ago, um, and, and I have no idea if it would have any applicability, but it, with these numbers, it's to, if, if we arbitrarily said, okay, hire a grade two teacher at Asimov Wompset, we're going to bring those class sizes a couple kids on average below Freetown. So then the opposite argument could ensue. How come, how come the advantage goes to that town? You know, so it's, it would be very hard for us to, to pick winners and losers in, in in the numbers that we have in front of us, but I'm wondering if at Asawampset, if there's some opportunity in some of these sections to use something like uh, para support or something to to be an equalizer. And I really don't know what that would look like, or if there's even any, you know, any worth in even looking at something like that. But I, I don't I don't think without some wholesale changes to how what our dist district philosophy is, and the possibility of you know kids that are on either side of Azel Road over there where the Freetown line literally cuts right through the road, you know, having some redistribution of, of where our kids go to even out some of these numbers. Um, I, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll endlessly be trying to even out these numbers. But it, is there a different way to provide some support at Asa Wompset to address some of the concerns that parents might have over there? I mean, I've fielded some comments to, of safety concerns for these class sizes. Um, you know, those concerns haven't gone away from when class sizes were 30 plus over at Asawamset, and I'm sure the same concerns were there for Freetown when they were 30 plus, but at, at 26, parents still have concerns of, of safety on top of education. Um, all right, that's, that's my thought there. Is there a different method to try to equalize things out? But then where does the funding come in? What do we cannibalize to do it? Well, um, my question is, Dr. Nash, um, when do you foresee us being able to post the integration specialists that were for RTI at the um, okay. elementary schools. Okay. Oh, okay. The um, integrate technology no, integration. I'm, I'm sorry. Not the, not, um, the para intervention. The interventions. Uh, those uh, we're meeting with the uh, paraprofessional union to impact bargain those. We had one meeting uh, in uh, August. We have another meeting coming up on job descriptions within a week and a half and then a full meeting of the rest of the committee. So depending on how that, all of that proceeds, uh, it could be very quickly in the, or it could proceed more slowly. I think there are, uh, I think that's being wrapped around some other discussion. So. Uh, in jobs. And don't answer the question if I legally can't ask this in public, but is there any way we can speed that process up along? Because it seems to me that there seems to be a critical shortage need that ASA wants it and the need seems to be there. And okay. those positions were in the budget. A couple of things. I think we're talking about apples and oranges if I read the job descriptions correctly. Uh, these are um, interventionists. They're, they would not function in the same capacity that paraprofessionals that I think Mr. Davenport is talking about, a general um, classroom paraprofessional. So they're different. They're for math and two, uh, literacy. So uh, their role and their job description is very different uh, than what I think we're talking about. So I don't see them as being, you know, unless I'm missing 
the job description that I read, I don't think they're at all um, what you're probably talking about at this time to help the general classroom teacher uh, in large class sizes. So. I want to point out the one thing about the equity because I think it's pretty, um, you, you know, you talk about boundaries and those are really tough issues on the elementary level when you talk about uh, wanting to go to your neighborhood school. I think um, much larger districts struggle with that all the time. Uh, thinking of Boston and, and uh, reading the paper about New Bedford and the, and the nurse not being in, in a school that's a neighborhood school and the parent being concerned that was on the, the front page of the newspaper today or yesterday. Uh, you're never going to have the parity um, because we're, we're, the numbers are very misleading when you have the integrated preschool program. You take that, back that number out and there's 136 different range of the, uh, in numbers alone between AES and FES in grades one through three. So that's, that's your apples to apples, if you will, I mean, excuse me, kindergarten through three. So the reality is you have 136 more students who attend AES. So you always have that issue that you're going to deal with unless you're exactly right. You get into that really hard discussion of redistricting, uh, which um, you can have. Do we go over this? Do we see any additional enrollments, unanticipated enrollments in, at the Freetown Elementary School? Uh, I'm not sure, Kim, that, that you would have that information. Uh, I don't know what's what, um, anyone who's come in. I don't know if I've seen some emails that Heather has sent to classroom teachers with children being added, but there's also been some emails about children withdrawing. Okay. Go ahead, Brett. So with David's earlier remarks about paras or other assistance that would be able to help with these larger class sizes, is that something we're going to discuss at this time? Or are we going to need to try and come up with a plan for that? Or is there nothing really proposed? I don't really know because we really don't have any funding sources identified right now because it's still too early in the process. They just ran the first payroll uh, September 4th. And what does the buffer look like, Fred? What does the payroll buffer right now look like, roughly? Um, when you say buffer, I'm not sure. Budget versus actual, just uh, um, not. Well, you know, on the on the straight lines, you know, without some of the categories I mentioned, you know, we have about 180 thousand. The problem is, you know, the obvious, the 120, 120 thousand contractual services cuts that down to 60. Um, you know, then there's the issues of um, whether the substitute teacher account is totally uh, inadequate. You know, but uh, I do need to go back a few more years or whether the year is just an anomaly. Um, I first looked for, you know, people with, uh, you know, where it might have been drawn by one or two people or three people, but that's not the case. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So we're talking about equity and the remarks we were having just now. I can look at this, and I know it's kind of hard for anyone to make decisions that doesn't apply to one place and then not have something happen at a different school. Um, the projections that we made were only off by 4% in any instance, with the exception of this very special case that took place at Gray's, where we're off by 11%. So it's very easy to see that it's not about equity as much as it is about fixing a problem. If we were, and I know that we don't have a funding source identified, um, I would just like us to keep in mind going forward with whatever we're going to do next, that there is an 11% difference in what our projection was and what we wound up with in that fourth grade class in grades. That's all. Anybody else from the committee? At this point, what is the committee, what's the will of the committee at this point? I just have one more question. Go ahead. Um, I think you briefly touched upon it. We, I think we were, you were asked about you could just do it again. Um, what would the impact be on the addition of paraprofessionals in the classroom in some of the larger portions of uh, our swamps? I mean, are they, do you believe that they would make a positive impact? Do you think it's important? Do you think it's really relevant? Um, you know, having someone that's not necessarily engaged in instruction, but is it is it a situation where that really is worth the additional cost to have those folks in there? And let me just add a spin for that that how do you determine who gets the para and who doesn't? Well, I would like to know if it's, I, I would like to know strictly if you, I could have my question answered. Is there, can you tell me that yes, that is a really good idea? <laughs> uh, or 
does it feel good? Well, first of all, they're two different jobs, um, two different job descriptions, and it would be you know, immoral and unethical for us to think that we can ask because we don't pay them that way, nor do we expect them to hold the credentials that a paraprofessional uh, instruct. Um, they really are in a support role. Uh, now, having said that, I'm also a realist, and I know that many districts um, don't use them that way. Uh, so. I have a very strong personal belief that they have a skill set that's important um, when it's utilized correctly, and, and that's where I'll end on that. Uh, I all, but however, there is a very obviously difference between a teacher and a paraprofessional. Um, they both have an important role. Uh, we see more and more uh, the paraprofessional particularly taking on a very specific, intense, a uh, specialized role working with students with special needs, receiving a lot of ABA training. They have a skill set, many of them, that is extraordinary. Uh, we probably tend to see fewer uh, at the upper elementary grades and more movement toward, uh, you know, RTI people who either hold um, credentials in reading uh, or ELA or SPED or a combination. But um, so, you know, there's a need, but if you're asking me to make a decision at this point, I have to go back to the philosophy that guided this district that I was not a part of, which was that you all who are here agreed to, to eliminate paraprofessionals. They were general ed paraprofessionals, and I don't know your mindset at that point. If you're asking me for my personal mindset, if this were my district back then, would I have done something different? No, you know, that's very different. If you're asking me for a personal belief, I always would opt to reduce class size and have another teacher in the classroom. That's just a given. I mean, that is a non-negotiable that you want class sizes that are as close as you can to what, what we know about improving teaching and learning. In other words, what we know is that what is the um, best class size that one could project. Um, but I see a very important role for paraprofessionals, as long as it's clearly defined, as long as they um, certainly have um, the skill set, and they uh, work in a manner that is very um, well um, defined uh, for their position. And, and that's what you have in the job descriptions, at least, that I've seen, the job description that you have for the um, para-interventionists. Those are very different positions than I've ever seen you know, in, in any other district, or at least in districts that I've worked in. So. I would just be concerned that we would, that this committee would go and, and do something like add a couple paraprofessional positions and not have it actually affect mm -hmm. anything. Where, we, yeah, we say we did something about it. I don't want to just do something because we, we thought we had to. Something for the sake of doing it. I want to, I want to be told that this is going to make an educational impact in the positive. And I know we don't have a lot of information tonight, but I haven't heard that yet. Well, reducing class size, adding a teacher, obviously means less kids directly in front of a teacher who delivers direct instruction. Paraprofessionals, by the nature of their jobs, don't deliver direct instruction. They are supportive in the classroom. They work with small groups, but it's under the direction of a certified teacher. And I think it goes back to an equity issue. If you're going to, you know, do this, you know, which grade do you pick and why? Um, what teachers should have them and why? And, and, you know, so that becomes, now you're into a whole other dynamic. Well, the reason I brought that up originally is, um, is to just throw out something in the range of possibilities if, if we are going to consider anything. I mean, uh, we do have another meeting coming up in a, a week. And um, perhaps I'm not suggesting what the committees, you know, uh, would would, would want to do right now, but I'd put out there perhaps that we see if we get a little bit more information from Bethany on how it would look with the, you know, with the addition of fourth grade uh, and the whole one versus two. Sounds like you'd want to go with two. And uh, asking uh, our ask Wamset principal that question about, about Paris, whether or not it would be truly valuable. I mean, I... I understand, I don't really understand, you know, paras because I'm not a teacher myself or a para, I suppose, but I do, I do understand what you're saying. Um, just the very nature of putting a para in a classroom, though, if, if they're truly supporting a teacher, 
one would think that a group of 26 would be more manageable with a, with a para than without. I mean, that ultimately would be what we would be trying to achieve. And is that what we need? Is, is, 20, is 26 unmanageable? Is it unsafe? Maybe there's one teacher that's just fine with 26. You know, may, maybe their, their skill set, they, they look at 26 kids and they're fine. I can take 26 and I can do a great job. Maybe another teacher, not, I'm not judging the quality of the teacher. I'm just saying maybe another teacher would be better with 22 or, or 26 in a para. I can't answer those questions, but if, if the community has some monies and we're a little bit undecided on what to do, maybe, maybe a little bit more information from our principals might, might be helpful. And, but we've only, we've only got a week but for I think the first thing would be for you to give us some direction for where you would like us to look at for funding. Because as you know, the funding source, no matter which direction we move in, whether we move to add a single teacher or some paras or nothing, we need to be able to say to you, uh, here's, you know, here's what it would mean. So you have some information to make some good decisions. Where would you like us to look at that? Would you like us to um, go back into the budget and do some more digging? Uh, just some, we need some direction because right now these are positions that we're looking at filling and I would assume that there would be some sustainability to these positions in next year's budget. And you've heard the fact that, that we've got an underfunded special needs budget, that it's, it's using circuit breaker monies. You're relying on that to fund the gap and it will do it now for this year. But we can't tell you that's going to happen next year. So your starting point looks very different. So I'm looking for sustainability. If I'm a classroom teacher, I want to know that I don't want that yo-yo of up and down. If I'm going to have a para or whatever, I, w I hope that next year we can we'll continue that. So that's one of the things. But we certainly can can bring more information back. We have a our ad council meeting on Tuesday, so we have plenty of opportunity. Our meeting with the school committee is Wednesday, but we would need some. I think I'm looking for some direction as to where would you like us to go back and, and look specifically at lines or anything else. <coughs> But if you come back to us next week with a recommendation from the principals of um, Asawamsa and Grace, um, what it would cost us to add either teachers or paras and um, any potential funding source in the budget. And I know we've got the uh, $520,000 um, SPED question hanging out there. So um, any potential funding sources we see in the budget, you might have to do some more archaeological budgeting. <laughs> right? Well, we have, just for clarification, we have that chart fall we anticipate covered through Circuit Breaker yep. um, with a little bit of extra. So we're not, so I just want to make sure that people don't say, what? We do anticipate that that will be covered. What I'm saying right. is the budget reflects a million three when it really should be reflecting about a million eight. And where you and that's so that you just know that's not atypical that we'll use circuit breaker. But circuit breaker is a year to year. You can carry it and use it the following year. We're using part of last year and then we're rolling over um, and using anticipated for this year. But we don't know that those extraordinary costs that you get for circuit breaker will happen in FY fifteen. I mean it's based on extraordinary cost over and above a certain figure for special needs students. So uh, so that changes. And then the rate of reimbursement for circuit breaker changes on a year-to-year -year basis. So that's why that's a moving target. You know, that's all I'm saying. Uh, we certainly can tell you what the average cost for a teacher is. We can tell you what the average cost for a paraprofessional is. We know that. And I can go back and meet with the principals of both those schools and put together, um, a, you know, more discussion with more detail. Uh, and we can identify some potential funding streams if there are any there or to tell you that this is the amount of money you have in positions that are not filled that you had approved as part of this budget. We can give you those figures and we can do that next Wednesday. Well, I, I think, uh, I'm sure I'm missing something, but we've got the tech integration specialists. Uh, that's going to represent some money. But if we forego them, then that's going to be like buying a car and parking it because we're not going to be utilizing our technology that we just spent a million dollars on, or not fully. Uh, we've got the 6 to 12 supervisors. And if we forego any or all of those, we're going to have 
is, from my understanding, we're going to have administrators that are overloaded with evaluations and all that they're going to be going to be gridlocked. And the, and the curriculum of the conference, mm -hmm. not just the it's a component. Yeah. yeah. And then we have the interventionists, and you know that title has been poked fun at a little bit in social media and stuff like that, but. The district invested several years in the RTI program, and it was showing great success, particularly at Freetown Elementary. And it was that thunder, I don't know, or the lightning strike. And if we uh, if we forego that, and we abandon a direction we we're several years into, what's the value of that? You know, we, we toss out that whole multi-year investment. <coughs> none of those are none of those are easy, but that's where our money is right now. So. Just for um, purposes uh, of numbers, you have 180,000 uh, that was in your budget for the curriculum uh, for the integration specialist. 180,000 for the six. And those are the three positions. 180,000 for the <coughs> six positions for the para interventionist, and 175, uh, which includes two components. 100. You remember 120 and 375 for the. Uh, up to as many as I could, you remember the school committee voted, I could spend up to that amount for up to three, um, but it probably won't fund three, uh, six, 12 um, supervisors. None of those, two of those have been posted and we have applications, um, Craig for, and, we, and Natalie uh, are leading that, uh, and the uh, supervisors have been posted, and the ones that have not been negotiated, as you know, are the para interventionist. Now, there's obviously money there because even if we fill any of these positions, we're not going to be filling them probably until mid October. So you're picking up um, some money in that salary for all of those because they didn't start the year. That could, you know, potentially, you know, when you start adding it up quickly in math, could, could help you. Uh, in that area, so that that's also potential. We'd have to sit down and really, you know, look at that and do some figuring, you know, number-wise, what does that mean, and if we fill them, or we could uh, fill them, or look for two or less than that, let's say, of a position, let's say. So, so there are some potentials, but and just to bring it back, I don't see this committee hiring a teacher or two teachers or anything like that, and. Um, I don't, I'm not saying that's not the right thing, but I have, you know, we've kind of skipped over something, which is where we still didn't hear, you know, whether or not it's the right thing to add a teacher. You know, we talked about the impact of the student. We talked about how these teachers are already on their way to driving their educational plan with the, the kids that they have. Before I was going to add a teacher, you would have to tell me emphatically that this is the right thing for the kids to do. I didn't hear that this evening. I did not. And did anyone else hear that this was the right thing to do was to add personnel? Ethically? No, 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 from our professional educators. Okay. Just toss that out, so Not in absolute terms. I think everybody would, would say there's a benefit, but we have to weigh that against, right. I, you know, all the discussion that, I won't repeat the discussion, but you're, you're asking if something was an absolute slam dunk, and no, I don't think that's been told yeah. to us tonight. I see it as a situation that, it would have been very difficult for us. I don't know. I don't believe it, was, it would be possible for us to predict that this would have happened. I just don't see how that could happen. I would like to take a very, very hard look at how we could do things differently, if there's any way that we possibly could predict any of this. And so there would be a less of an impact if it were to occur again. Um, I just, at this point, you know, I, I don't see how we're going to be able to one afford or appropriately add sessions to any class after the beginning of school. I would be a little bit more, uh, I, would, I would be a little less <coughs> convinced of that if these class sizes were somehow way out of proportion from what we anticipated. Some of them are certainly concerning. I would definitely say that. I'm not n unconcerned about these class sizes. I would definitely like to see them lower. And I think that I've, you know, all along my tenure on the school committee has said, yeah, the lower the class size, we, we want these below 20. We really do, and I don't think that we want to lose sight of the fact that, you know, 24, 25 is not okay. It's not okay. We want to do better than that. But given the circumstances where we anticipated one thing and received another, is there any way that we possibly could have anticipated any of that? I don't know the answer to that right now. We've got to take a very, very good hard, very, very hard look at how we do it. You know, if we, if we had, you know, put in a couple 
positions here or there, you know, that's padding the budget. We were instructed by, by, by our communities. You know, certainly the, the, the day and age of that is over. We're not going to be, you know, uh, we, we have to deal with real numbers and do the very best with, with what we have. The school budget, I've always said, is extremely dynamic. I mean, we're reacting from day to day, not just the opening of the school, but day to day, October to October, October to December. You know, we, have, we have no idea what, what we're going to be up against. So given the budget situation the way it was, given the way that <clears throat> we made our goals, given the way that we developed our budget with no ability to react to these types of things, I think we take a look at how we do it differently, responsibly, and kind of uh, you know, take, see if there's any kind of way that we can make some small patches or small movements to, to, to improve things. I just don't see adding teachers at this point as a solution. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gifford. Anyone else from the committee? Once, twice. Okay, I'm going to close the discussion on it then. Do you want to go, Carolyn? No, I was just, I was just going to say I think we owe it to the community members, um, to e each individual parent, to, to take a look if there's a way that we can help out. Um, it may not be through teachers, it may be through paras or, or additional support. I think we owe it to the community to take, take that extra look. And we're still talking on, we still have pairs as, as an option or other assistance on the table, I think. I don't know that we're crossing out anything in particular. If we magically come up with something. I mean, if we look at the salary savings on five people not being hired by November 1st, that's one FT, right? Co correct. But I want to caution you, though, that we were given a charge by the community <laughs> that they did not want us overspending our budget. We voted a budget of $33,095,000, and that... They wanted us to stay within that means because in past years we funded the budget, you know, with extra money that was available and stuff. We've added positions and then we don't have the sustainability. Then we get into a situation where the budget is 1.8 million short and growing. Not that it is this year, but last year that seemed to be the case. So we were given specific direction by the taxpayers, the parents, you know, that we have a household budget. We have to live within our means, you know. So I want to make sure, and from my point of view, and I'm just one person, that we stay within our means as much as possible and deliver the best education we can to our kids. I think that there are some good issues raised tonight, and there's some good questions raised tonight. That equity of the schools, and with Lakeville, and I don't have an opinion on this, nor do I have the answers, but with some sections of Lakeville being so close to Freetown, do we offer, do we look at the possibility of breaking down these so-called barriers? I mean, the kids that walk through the door are no different. You know, a kid that comes in from Freetown, and we've said this before, doesn't come in, you know, wearing a blue jacket that says, I'm from Freetown, and a kid from Lakeville doesn't come in wearing a red jacket that says, I'm from Lakeville. I mean, do we look at, does the school committee look at breaking down those barriers and sending Lakeville Elementary School kids to Freetown Elementary, or vice versa, if all of a sudden Freetown had a big housing boom and we had all this enrollment and Massawampsit had a decrease, you know? And do we look at creating a policy? I know we've danced around the issue, but I'd like to see a policy in place where we identify our target class numbers and we work hard towards that. And we put things in place so that way when we get close to approaching those numbers, certain events happen, like the school committee's notified, the superintendent's notified, and the business manager, and we have these kind of meetings and these kind of discussions, you know, so. That's all I have for comments. Anyone else from the committee? No. All right, I'm gonna close the discussion on this. I'm gonna open it up to community speaks on the agenda item of class sizes, grades, um, K to five. Please come up to the podium, so that way the view is um, on Lakeville Cable.
and they had a couple of AM, uh, 23 AM students and 15 PM students, which is not unlike this year's kindergarten. The grade one last year had 145 students, and grade two now has 149. So to me, it's only a five increase student from what I thought it would be. Having given the numbers from the school on November 30th, 2012, so I would not be at all surprised by 149 in grade two because it was 145 in grade one last year. Grade three, these are just numbers I went back and looked at while I was sitting here. Grade two, as an example, last year had 118 students. So grade three having 122 is four more in theory than the move of the straight students from grade to grade. So these don't really surprise me at all. It's, it's pretty much as I had expected. Uh, grade one class size average as compared to the numbers that I had given to me last year by the school was grade one had the same 24 average. Grade two this year has one more student as an average. And I'm not necessarily saying that 25 is the right number. I'm only doing a mathematical comparison. Grade three last year had a 23 average, so it went up by one. Grade four uh, last year had a 25 average, I believe, and it's gone to 27. And grade five had a 25 average, and it stayed at 25. So. The numbers should not come as a surprise. It's simply a move of the next class. There's obviously there's move-ins in town, but there's a lot of move out. So to me, if, if grade two is overloaded at 149, it's only five more, four more, than last year's grade one. So those numbers don't surprise me. Uh, those numbers came from the school, just did the math here. The policy of class sizes by grade, and more importantly by subject, this has been asked and suggested by the public and also discussed at the school committee. <coughs> one talks about a school size of the one to five, or K to five, because that's what the agenda is. We certainly need to do that for the entire school system. Because if you have an overcrowded grade two and four, because we're somewhat addressing those tonight, or two and five, and four. Uh, if you simply hired someone to solve those problems, uh, you'd be forced to hire a couple of teachers minimally per year. And that goes through the school system as those that particular overcrowded class moves, unless you're willing to move teachers. But last year, school enrollment went down, and we hired over four teachers. The so I really would caution you to hire a uh, solve a specific grade problem without looking at all grades. And the analysis that was given tonight, I think, is a great start. But I'd ask that you go back for the last couple of years to really see the trend. Because I don't, th this does not surprise me at, at the S1 to elementary, the one I happen to drive. Uh, the school system, it's difficult to talk K through five without talking about the school system. So if we talk about the school system and say that there's 3,000 students, the enrollment in the school system, I believe, has gone down almost 200 students in the last five years. And yet we added teachers. Uh, if those numbers are wrong, a schedule like this would show us that that's not true. But uh, I have the numbers as su supplied by the school. So the school enrollment overall has gone down. I don't know what it's done this year. Has gone down and we've hired teachers. So last year, once again, we hired uh, four teachers. So the policy, I think, obviously needs to be written. Uh, I'm a proponent of small class sizes. Okay. I'd maybe do it differently. 
and it's difficult just to talk about K through five without talking about the philosophy of class sizes. So I'll say let's develop the class size uh, schedule and then we can talk about specific classes. Uh, and I think that's somewhat obvious. Uh, so overall enrollment I think goes down but certain schools obviously go up but not by dramatic numbers. The number has not changed dramatically from the previous year in the numbers that I that I looked at. Thank you. If you have a different set, let me know. Thank you, Mr. Thank Potterly. You. Cindy Stork, um, first grade teacher at Salonta, an advocate for young children, have been for years. I think it's important when we talk about numbers to understand what those numbers mean. Yesterday I had 25 beautiful children enter my classroom. If I were to bring my class with me this evening, they would fill the first row, they would fill the second row, and they would fill half of that third row. They would nearly fill your audience. I think it's important to know what 25 means or 26 means. As a taxpayer, I would encourage the committee to seriously consider policy, class size policy. Look in that direction, I know it's been mentioned before. Um, I agree with the administration, we, we have a, a train that's left the station, I agree, um, but we have a whole school year, and um, we have little ones who need to be noticed. We have fourth graders that need to be noticed. We wanna meet the needs of every child in our district. So I would encourage us all just to work together to meet those needs. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? No one once, twice, three times? Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to start off with um, a thank you to Dr. Nash and to Mr. LaBelle because this is the first year, no, about three or four, where I walked in the door on the first day of school and felt like I was supporting children and I was not just working towards data. And I, I, I thank you so much. You don't know how much you energized me those, those first days, really. But also, I want to say that I, there's a few things we need to remember historically. The regionalization agreement. Each town is supposed to have their own elementary school. So you need to keep that in mind when you're districting. Um, we did lose a teacher at Asalanta because one of them left us for another job. So there was a loss of a teacher in the first grade. All right. We, they did move them to second because it looked like that's where the bulk was going to be. Um, I'm a primary teacher. I'm not a, an elementary teacher. I'm not a high school teacher. I'm a primary teacher. So I'm kind of like Cindy. Little ones need more time. They can't do half the thing. First day of school. Mrs. Martin, Mrs. Martin, my shoe. My shoe's off, Mrs. Martin. I haven't got my foot in my shoe. Well, oh, honey, go on and tie it and put your shoe in. Goes and ties it, comes back to me and goes, Mrs. Martin, Mrs. Martin, my shoe, my foot's in my shoe now. Well, go tie your shoe. I can do the first part. Goes back, does the first part. Now, this is a second grader. So one of the friends helped him tie his shoe. There's, a, there's such a difference between primary children and the amount of time. That's why a large class is very difficult for a primary teacher because you have to spend more time with even the motherly things. And the last thing was how we got our figures. The last administration, um, NESTEC, was how they used most of the, got most of their figures. They didn't take into account the building in the town and they didn't take into account the um, apartment buildings in Lakeville because that was brought up on more than one meeting. And as you said, Thank God we didn't close ass wants it because we would have been dire straits. So again, just those couple of historical pieces. And again, thank you, Dr. Nash, and thank you, Mr. LaBelle, for making me love to walk in my school again. Thank you, Mrs. Martin and uh, Mrs. Stock. It's good to hear from the teachers so we can hear a frontline um, perspective. And I have a child at Freetown Elementary as well as a fourth grader. 
Um, everyone keeps saying the train has left, left the station. However, it seems as if a big tree just fell on the train tracks. We need to address it. Something has to be done. Excuse me. <laughs> um, two years ago in the first grade at FES, a teacher was added maybe two weeks into the school year. And those children adjusted fine. My child was not one of them. My child probably would not have adjusted as well. I agree with Ms. Penault that if we get new teachers for the fourth grade, it would have to be two to agree with, to go along with team teaching. I don't know what the right answer is, but we need to do something. Thank you. Anyone else from the uh, audience? One more second. <laughs> There's also currently a lot of building in Newtown. So last year it was written up as a desirable place to live. There's going to be a lot more people moving in. Thank you. Anyone else? Once, twice, three times, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. direction for next Wednesday's meeting, I want to make sure that we're prepared. Uh, so do, is the committee asking that we come back with, the recommendation. with recommendations um, dealing with reducing class size at AES and grace in grade four and cost, <laughs> how we would do that and cost and potentially identify where some funding costs might be? Is that um, I don't. I don't think the only idea at AES was to reduce class size. I think. Uh, oh, to add a power. Was yes, to what, that, you know yes. whether or not there's classroom supports. That yes. Could be. Yes. That's what I. When I say reduce class size, I mean it in the sense of coming back with a model. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Anyone else? Once, twice, three times. Motion to adjourn so we can get our hardworking administrators home so they can be bright and cheery eyed for the children tomorrow. Okay. Have a motion in a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you all for coming tonight.